The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. This is the preface. Lacan presents us with a radically new theory of subjectivity. Unlike most post-structuralists who seek to deconstruct and dispel the very notion of the human subject, Lacan, the psychoanalyst, finds the concept of subjectivity indispensable and explores what it means to be a subject, how one comes to be a subject, the conditions responsible for the failure to become a subject, leading to psychosis, and the tools at the analyst's disposal to induce a precipitation of subjectivity. It is, however, extremely difficult to piece together the wide variety of things Lacan says about the subject, his theory of the subject being so un unintuitive to most of us. Consider the definition Lacan so often reiterates. The subject is that which one signifier represents to another signifier, and evolving quite significantly in the course of his work. Moreover, in the late 1970s and 1980s in the United States, Lacan was probably better known as a structuralist due to the discussion of his work on language and on Edgar Allan Poe's the purloined letter, and readers in the English-speaking world are often more familiar with a Lacan who uncovers the workings of structure at every turn, even at the very core of what we take to be our most precious, inalienable selves, seemingly leaving aside the, the problematic of subjectivity altogether. In part one of this book, I retrace Lacan's extremely far-reaching examination of otherness, as that which is alien or foreign to an as yet unspecified subject. That otherness runs the unlikely gamut from the unconscious, the other as language, and the ego, the imaginary other, ideal ego, and the other as desire, ego ideal, to the Freudian superego, the other as jouissance. We are alien. We are alienated insofar as we are spoken by a language that functions in certain respects like a machine, computer, or recording, assembling device with a life of its own, insofar as our needs and pleasures are organized and channeled into socially acceptable forms by our parents' demands, the other as demand, and insofar as our desire comes into being as the other's desire, while Lacan incessantly invokes the subject in his seminars and written texts, the other very often seems to steal the limelight. Yet it is precisely the extension of the concept of structure or otherness in Lacan's work to its furthermost reaches that allows us to see where structure leaves off and something else begins, something that takes exception to structure. In Lacan's work, that which takes exception is twofold, the subject and the object, object A as cause of desire. In part two of this book, I show that, departing from his early phenomenological notions in the 1950s, Lacan defines the subject as a position adopted with respect to the other as language or law. In other words, the subject is a relationship to the symbolic order. The ego is defined in terms of the imaginary register, whereas the subject as such is essentially a positioning in relation to the other. As Lacan's notion of the other evolves, the subject is reconceptualized as a stance adopted with respect to the other's desire, the mother's, parent's, or parent's desire, insofar as that desire arouses the subject's desire, that is, functions as object A. Ever more influenced by Freud's earliest work, in his own psychoanalytic practice, Lacan begins to cast his theoretical evolution in very schematic terms, to see that something in relation to which the subject adopts a stance as a primal experience of pleasure, pain, or trauma. The subject comes into being as a form of attraction toward and defense against a primordial, overwhelming experience of what the French call jouissance, a pleasure that is excessive leading to a sense of being overwhelmed or disgusted, yet simultaneously providing a source of fascination. 
While in the late 1950s, Lacan views being as something granted the human subject due only to its fantasized relation to the object, which brought on that traumatic experience of jouissance. He eventually formulates the subject's primordial experience of jouissance as stemming from its traumatic encounter with the other's desire. The subject, lacking in being, is thus seen to consist in relation to, or a stance adopted with respect to, the other's desire as fundamentally thrilling and yet unnerving, unnerving, fascinating and yet overwhelming or revolting. While the child wishes to be recognized by its parents as worthy of their desire, their desire is both me mesmerizing and lethal. The subject's precarious existence is sustained by fantasies constructed to keep the subject at just the right distance from that dangerous desire, delicately balancing the attraction and the repulsion. Nevertheless, that is, in my view, but one face of the Lacanian subject. The subject is fixated as symptom, as a repetitive, symptomatic way of getting off or obtaining jouissance. The sense of being that is provided by fantasy is false being, as Lacan refers to it in the mid-1960s, suggesting thereby that there is something more. Predictably enough, the second face of the Lacanian subject appears in the overcoming of that fixation, the reconfiguring or traversing of fantasy, and the shifting of the way in which one gets one's kicks or obtains jouissance, that is the face of subjectivi subjectivization, a process of making one's own something that was formerly alien. Through this process, a complete reversal occurs in one's position in relation to the other's desire. One assumes responsibility for the other's desire, that foreign power that brought one into being. One takes that causal alterity upon oneself, subjectifying what had previously been experienced as an external, extraneous cause, a foreign roll of the dice at the beginning of one's of one's universe. Destiny. Lacan suggests here a paradoxical move by the analysand, prepared by a specific approach on the analyst's part to subjectivity, the cause of his or her existence, the other's desire that brought him or her into this world, and to become the subject of his or her own fate. Not, it happened to me, but I saw, I heard, I acted. Hence the gist of Lacan's multiple translations of Freud's Wo es war, Saul, ik, worden, where the other pulls the strings, acting as my cause, and must come into being as my own cause. As for the object, discussed in detail in part three of this book, it evolves alongside the theory of the subject, just as the subject is first viewed as a stance adopted with respect to the other, and then with respect to the other's desire. The object is first viewed as an other, like oneself, and is eventually equated with the other's desire. The parents' desire brought the child into the world in a very material sense, serving as cause of the child's very being. Um, I lost my spot somehow. <laughs> and eventually as cause of its desire. Fantasy stages the position in which the child would like to see itself with respect to the object that causes elicits and incites its desire. It is Lacan's theory of the object as cause of desire, not as something which could somehow satisfy desire, that allows us to understand certain of Lacan's innovations in analytical, in analytic technique. Lacan reconceptualizes the analyst's position in terms of the roles the analyst must avoid, those of imaginary other, and of judgmental, all-knowing other implicit in ego psychology approaches, and the role he or she must position him or herself to play in the subject's fantasy. Object A, in order to bring about ever greater subjectiv subjectivization by the analysand of the foreign causes that brought him or her into being. In Lacan's view of the analytic setting, the analyst is not called on to play the good object, the good enough mother, or the strong ego which allies with the patient's weak one. Rather, the analyst must, by maintaining a position of enigmatic desire, 
come to serve as object in the subject's fantasy in order to bring about a reconfiguration of fantasy, a new stance in relation to jouissance, a new subject position. One of the tools for doing so at the analyst's disposal is time, the variable length session being a mean by, means by which to generate the tension necessary to separate the subject from its fantasized relation to the other's desire. The object is also elaborated by Lacan as the cause that upsets the smooth functioning of structures, systems, and axiomatic fields, leading to aporias, paradoxes, and conundrums of all kinds. It is the real which is encountered at the points where language and the grids we use to symbolize the world break down. It is the letter which insists whenever we try to use the signifier to account for everything and to say it all. The object thus has more than one function. As the other's desire, it elicits the subject's desire. But as the letter or signifierness, significance of the signifier, it has a materiality or substance associated with another kind of pleasure. It is, in a sense, the poly polyvalence of object A that leads Lacan to distinguish sexual desire, the pleasure of desire or desiring, which he refers to as phallic jouissance, or more felicitously, as symbolic jouissance, from another kind of pleasure, the other jouissance. These two faces of the object, A and S, allow for an understanding of sexual difference that is yet to be grasped in the English language work on Lacan, and that goes far beyond current interpretations suggesting that, according to Lacan, masculine means subject and feminine means object, or that Lacan falls into the old Freudian trap of equating mas masculinity with activity and having femininity f with activity and having femininity with passivity and not having two faces of the subject and two faces of the object parallel binary oppositions i think not rather a form of godelian structuralism as i call it where every system is decompleted by the alterity or heterogeneity it contains within itself the status of psychoanalytic discourse taken up in part four of this book is an unavoidable issue for clinicians practicing in a, in a scientific context like the United States. In an environment in which the director of the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington can openly declare that the medical establishment is likely to conquer virtually all mental illness by the year 2000. Oh, gosh golly, that was a failure. In which day after day, the papers announce that the gene responsible for alcoholism homosexuality, phobia, schizophrenia, or what have you, has been found, and in which naive scientific attacks on the foundations of psychoanalysis can be taken as serious blows to its credibility. Analysts and the analytically inclined must become better equipped to, intel to intelligently discuss the epistemological status of their field. For while psychoanalysis may not constitute a science, as science is currently understood, it has no need to seek legitimation from the existing medical or scientific establishment. Lacan's work provides us the wherewithal to constitute psychoanalysis as a discourse, which is at once historically dependent on the birth of science, and yet able to stand on its own two feet, so to speak. Psychoanalysis, as conceptualized by Lacan, is not only a discourse with its own specific grounding, but also one that is in a position to analyze the structure and workings of other disciplines, both academic and scientific, shedding new light on their mainsprings and blind spots. Lacan points to the possibility of radicalizing or revolutionizing science, as it is usually understood, by introducing psychoanalytic notions therein, thus, in a sense, pushing back the frontiers of science in such a way as to redefine the object of scientific inquiry. Instead of claiming, as some do, that psychoanalysis is doomed to forever remain outside the field of science, Lacan's point is rather that science is not yet equal to the task of accommodating psychoanalysis. Scientific discourse may someday be recast in such a way as to encompass psychoanalysis within its ambit, but in the meantime psychoanalysis can continue to elaborate its own distinctive praxis. 
clinical practice in theory building. This thumbnail sketch indicates the general trajectory of my argument and will, I hope, serve the reader as something of a roadmap in reading this book to be referred back to occasionally as needed. For while subject, object, other, and discourse are the main concepts developed here, to discuss them in context requires an explanation of a great many more of Lacan's basic concepts and of his earlier and later attempts to formulate psychoanalytic experience using, using them. Some of the concepts that Lacan shaped and reshaped in the course of his career and that I am led to take up here include the imaginary, symbolic, and real, need, demand, desire, and jouissance, the subject of the statement, the subject of enunciation, or speaking subject, the subject of the unconscious, the split subject, the subject as a defense, and the subject as metaphor, the paternal metaphor, primal repression and secondary repression, neurosis, psychosis, and perversion, the signifier, the master or unary signifier, and the binary signifier, the letter and signifierness, the phallus as the signifier of desire, the phallic function, sexual difference, phallic jouissance, other jouissance, masculine structure, and feminine structure, alienation, separation, the traversing of fantasy, and the pass, punctuation, interpretation, the variable length session, and the role of the analyst as pure desire, desirousness, existence and ex, existence and ex existence, the four discourses: masters, hysterics, analysts, and university, their mainsprings and the sacrifices they entail, knowledge, misrecognition, and truth, discourse, meta language, and suture, formalization, polarization, and transmission. The roadmap provided in this preface will hopefully help the reader distinguish the forest from the trees in my exposition of this broad range of concepts. The chapters in part one aim at simplicity, assuming little if any previous knowledge of Lacan's work. Part two, three, and four become progressively more complex, building upon the foundations laid in the earlier parts of the book. Certain readers may wish to skip some of the denser chapters the first time through, such as chapters 5, 6, and 8. Moving, for example, directly from chapter 7 on object A to chapters 9 and 10 on discourse. Many of the chapters can be read independently, even though they, they do build on and occasionally refer back to material that has come before. Readers with a good deal of prior knowledge of Lacan's work will probably want to skip chapter 1 altogether and perhaps even go directly to chapter 5, merely thumbing through the earlier material. One of my more general aims in this book is to begin to re-situate discussion of Lacan's work in a context which does not leave clinical considerations by the wayside. In America, the psychoanalytic community has resisted Lacan's thought for several decades now, whereas the more literary and linguistically minded have demonstrated the greatest and most enduring interest in his work. The historical and intellectual reasons for this situation are too well known to be reiterated here, but the result has, in my view, been a skewed or partial representation of his thought. While the present book was not written with clinicians specifically in mind, my own experience with the praxis that is psychoan psychoanalysis does, I believe, form its backdrop. I have made no pretense in this book of presenting a balanced view of Lacan's work, a, balan a balanced view would have to provide a great deal of historical perspective on Lacan's development, explaining his multifarious, surrealist, Freudian, phenomenological, existential, post-Freudian, Saussurian, Jacobsonian, and Levi-Straussian influences, just for starters, and situate Lacan's forays into psychoanalytic theory in the context of debates going on in France and elsewhere at the time. Instead, I have attempted to present a view of Lacan's work, which many will no doubt find overly static and closed. One of the many fascinations of his work lying precisely in its constant transformations, self-corrections and reversals of perspective. I have endeavored to provide a view of several of Lacan's major concepts, not as they evolved from the 1930s on, but rather from a 1970s perspective. 
On occasion, I try to guide the reader through certain of Lacan's early ways of formulating psychoanalytic experience by translating them into Lacan's own later terms. But in general, I provide a cut of Lacanian theory that I consider to be particularly powerful and useful to the clinician and theorist alike. Opposition such as that between full and empty speech found in Lacan's earliest seminars are, to my way of thinking, superseded in his later work. Thus, as interesting as they may be in their own right, I have preferred to let others present them. My punctuation of Lacan's thought, which emphasizes certain developments and de-emphasizes others, will, I hope, allow the reader to orient him or herself better in the voluminous mass of Lacan's published and yet-to-be-published work. Having taught classes for a number of years on the basis of certain of Lacan's seminars, following the step-by-step development of a particular concept, like that of psychoanalytic ethics in seminar 12, wait, no, 7, 7, or transference in seminar 8. The excitement of seeing such an active and creative mind at work is often overshadowed by the difficulty involved in isolating an identifiable thesis. Working through Lacan's seminars is an important task for all serious students of psychoanalysis, and yet it is, in my experience, helpful to have a number of landmarks in what may otherwise be perceived as a somewhat amorphous field. The task of interpreting Lacan's work, like that of interpreting Plato's and Freud's, endless, and I mean and I make no pretense here of having the last word. It should be clear that what I am offering up here is an interpretation. In, partic- in particular, the theory of the Lacanian subject presented in chapters 5 and 6, six is my own, and my reading of Lacan's work on sexual difference in chapter 8 is likewise original. The appendices include material too technical to maintain the general flow of the discussion here, They concern Lacan's detailed models of the structure of language and the the effects generated by the anomaly that arises within within it, object A. In the glossary provided at the end of this book, the reader will find short explanations of the major symbols, known as mathemes, discussed in these pages. Lacan's mathemes condense and embody a considerable quantity of conceptualization, and while I have attempted in the glossary to summarize the most salient aspects, Their proper use requires a firm overall grasp of Lacan's theoretical framework. When quoting Lacan's work, I have, wherever possible, provided references to the English editions, but I have taken considerable liberties with the existing translations. Their inadequacies are becoming ever more glaring. Écrit 1966 refers to the French edition of the Écrit published by Soy in Paris while Écrit alone refers to Alan Sheridan's 1977 English selection published by Norton. Page references to seminars 1, 2, 7, and 11 always correspond to the English translations published by Norton. I refer to the seminars by their numbers alone. Full references are found in the bibliography. While quoting Freud's work, I have provided volume and page numbers from the standard edition, abbreviated SE, but I have often modified the translations on the basis of far more interesting or striking non-standard translations. So this preface was written in April 1990, 1994.